Hello everyone and welcome to Life Questions. I'm Bill Harris, your host. If you are like many Christians, you have questions about life and you are looking for biblical insights and solutions. Well, you've come to the right place. Today we are joined by a panel of local ministers who have prayerfully reviewed your viewer questions and they are ready to share their perspectives. I want you to meet them right now. They are Pastor Brad Taylor of the Lima Community Church, followed by Pastor Chris Langstaff of Bell Center Church of Christ. And then there's Pastor Neil Whitney of the church at Allentown and rounding off our panel today is Pastor Rich Reiki. He is the Director of International Ministries at Teens for Christ. Gentlemen, we're happy you could be back. Great to be Thank here. You. We had such a fine discussion last week. We thought we'd do some more of it this week. <laughs> All right. Here's a question from viewers that I think we need to kick off our discussion with today. Why does it seem that it's so often women reading the Bibles, uh, their Bibles daily and guiding their children in spiritual manners, matters, I think this is probably saying. Uh, what will it take to get more men to step up and take the spiritual lead in the household? And it says that this is being submitted by a female viewer who is frustrated that her husband is not more active in the family's spiritual guidance. Do you think perhaps there's a lot of that being repeated throughout society? Simply put, I think that uh, what I've observed in, in the discipleship model that we, we use um, in small group, accountability groups, uh, same gender, uh, men with men, women with women, is the idea that uh, most men have never been discipled. Women tend to do it a little bit more, even if it's informal, because mm -hmm. of how they group socially. Yeah. But, but most men have never been discipled. The closest that might have ever happened to them is a coach in high school. Mm -hmm. And they don't really make the connection between that and spirituality. Mm -hmm. And so my suggestion would be encourage your husband in his own spiritual journey to connect with a group of guys or a particular person to be discipled. Mm -hmm. and that discipleship process will happen naturally. Well, he'll want to pour into the generation coming behind him, sure. but nagging him to be involved is counterproductive. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not saying, of course, that this viewer was nagging, but right, right. <laughs> she might be on the brink well, of it. That, that's what we've <laughs> seen in, yeah. in uh -huh. church is that uh -huh. the wife gets frustrated, uh, you know, they become nagging and, and that's counterproductive to the relationship. It's counterproductive spiritually. It's counterproductive to motivation. Mm -hmm. What do you want to say, Pastor Brad? So I, I think that um, one of the things, just even, even reading the way the question is worded, I, I sort of feel like I need to say how glad I am that my wife reads her Bible every day and, mm -hmm. and that she leads our children. I mean, I, my wife's perfectly capable of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because I'm a pastor and, uh, you know, I've been walking with Jesus for X number of years doesn't mean that she's less capable than I am of growing spiritually, of, of leading our, our children sure, and sure. speaking into them. I'm so grateful for the, the influence that she has mm -hmm. in them. Um, I think that there's, uh, there's a, a little truth that I share with just about everybody I counsel. Uh, I'm sure we all see this in different counseling relationships, but the reality is you can't change anybody but you. You're the only, you're the only thing you can change. You can't mm -hmm. change somebody else. And um, I'm sure that there are many of us in my own life, I, I remember, especially early in our marriage, times that I thought something in my wife needed to be different and how gently the Holy Spirit would say to me, why don't you let me worry about that? And now let me address this in you that needs to be changed, yeah. which was yeah. always a humbling reality. But uh, just uh, maybe a word of encouragement to this, this viewer who asked this question and any who are in a like situation. There, you can't do anything to change anybody but yourself. And so continue growing, continue doing what you're doing, growing closer to Jesus, continuing to pray and, uh, and focus mostly on what it is that God's doing in your own life. Do you think though that nonetheless it might be wise if a wife says to a husband in a nice way, kind way that, you know, make a suggestion, honey, if, if you could step up and be the leader here and I would be there to support you backing that up, uh, maybe that would bring sure. him some insight, you know, where he's missing it. Is yeah. that, is, is that possible? Well, sure. 
Absolutely. And she backs that up with the foundation of prayer, because mm -hmm. it says that a man will be sanctified by the prayers of the wife. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if she backs that up with prayer, <laughs> men are really difficult. So all you women out there, men are difficult. <laughs> I'm not telling you anything you don't know. <laughs> but men are difficult. They're a product of their nature and their nurture. It's their DNA and it's their environmental traits, their inherited traits. And uh, thankfully, we have a supernatural God that can help us with that process through prayer. And uh, I'll go back to do your best. Women need to trust God. That's my wife. She trusts God. She prayed for me for years and years and years. And this morning, I'm sure she was probably still praying for me. <laughs> Thank you. But she, she approached me with, with wisdom and grace mm -hmm. and truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the best way. Yeah. We see something similar to this in Proverbs 31, where the, the writer of the proverb talks about uh, the, the role that uh, a woman can play in the family. Yeah. Um, I, I would by no means discount what this viewer is already doing. Um, and, and to your point, you know, continue more, continue to, to be uh, the spiritual leader, because somebody has to be. To, to say, well, I, I'm not, the, I'm not the, the, the man, so I don't have a role to play, I think is misguided. And again, not yeah, saying that yeah. she's thinking this, um, but uh, continue to pray. Uh, in my own family, we have a situation like that where uh, the, the wife w was faithful church attending, uh, brought, the, brought the kids to church every Sunday. The husband wanted nothing to do with it. In God's timing, the Holy Spirit convicted my uncle and he gave his life to the Lord, and he, in essence, uh, built our church building as the general contractor. So uh, I would encourage this, uh, this listener and this reader to, to continue praying, continue yeah. um, playing the hand you're dealt, yeah. uh, and, and God will, will bring the increase in his time. And I think what I, the theme of what I hear you talking about is that woman praying for her husband. That, that, that's what's so key. And um, so she, we want to have her, the, the, the writer, encouraged by the fact that, yeah, she is praying for him and she's backing him and she, she just don't back off of that. And, and I think also getting other people involved. So there, there should be a godly male influence in her children's life at some point uh, through church, through a youth group, through a fellowship, through, you know, maybe it's a grandparent, maybe it's a neighbor, whatever. But they do need to see the example of a, of a godly man living out his faith that this, without bashing the husband, but this, it, this isn't just for women. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guys, you know, that grow up in their teenage years and they say, well, well, faith is, it, you know, for, for superstitious women, <laughs> right? And, 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 it, and, and it's, a, it's the softer, gentler side and they don't really see faith as something that's, that's godly. They don't really see faith as something that's um, important to them. And I, I think it goes, you know, to our next question, which is, you know, you see uh, parents, grandparents heartbroken over the decisions of young adults leaving the faith. And why is that? Well, part of that is they don't have godly examples of what it looks like, maybe, of people living out their faith or making it a daily practice. Yeah, we maybe we take our kids to church and we expect the church to disciple them, we expect the church to train them, but, but who's walking with them to help mm -hmm. them make life decisions mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to model godly behavior, godly living, and the more we involve other people in the life, I think it was Awana that came out with a study just this last fall that said um, it, one other person besides the family involved in a child's spiritual development increases, it's like 50 or 60% oh, yeah. yeah. their, their likelihood of staying with the faith beyond high school. Yeah. Wow. Just one person outside of the family yeah. makes that amount of difference who takes a legitimate interest in their spiritual well-being. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, ask yourself the question, how many messages in your life have radically changed your life 
versus how many people in your life have radically changed your life. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a statistic, Pastor Rich, similar to what you're talking about there from the Fuller Youth Institute that is I think it's even a little more pronounced. It's if you if a teenager has relationships with five people in their church that are of different generations uh, besides their family members, it's it's uh, almost unheard of for that teenager to leave the faith. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just that the value that comes in surrounding yourself with a community, with the body, that uh, what a difference that makes in, in helping children maintain their faith as they, as they grow. Yeah, well, you, you've, you've touched on what was going to be the next question. So let me just bring it out there and we can have at it with it. Uh, We've only got so much time left before the break, but we can sure. carry on after the break yeah. too. It says here, every month we hear from parents and grandparents who are brokenhearted over the decisions of young adults in their family who have walked away from the faith. What encouragement can you offer them? And what suggestions can you give young parents who are at the start of the process of raising children? So... Well, number one on what parents should be doing, Deuteronomy uh, 6, 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and your daughters. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So that's, you want to expand on it? Do that. Do that. <laughs> Appreciate that expansion. Yeah, yeah. Nike has do it right. It. Just yeah. do it. Yeah. Well, I think it's why do we do what we do? So why? And, and, and making sure that God, you know, well, because the word says this, mm -hmm. you know, we, we choose to give to church or we choose to tithe or we choose not to have those things because our faith informs those decisions, right? We don't talk to people that way because... We love people, we respect people, we honor people, we don't use that language. We, you know, so I think it's tying it back to the word, you know, in, mm -hmm. in, in what Neil's saying. The other thing I, I would, the only advice I would give to parents is, and this was something that I had to come by hard, is you have to trust that God loves your child more than you do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult thing to do in some cases, I'll bet, yeah you can do your best and that's not going to keep them from walking away because they are responsible for their own soul but you have to trust hopefully mm -hmm. you know you generally true the proverb mm -hmm. is train up a child in the way that they yeah. should go and they will yeah. return back to it. but but the idea is you have to trust that God loves them more than you do and God will give them every opportunity to come back to make the right decision to avoid consequences. All right, let, let, let's pause right there and take a break. And I want us to continue more. We're on a, we're on a real hot button subject here. We'll be back with more. So don't stay. Don't 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 touch the dial. <laughs> You're going to want to hear what we have to say next on this subject. Stay with us. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and thank you for staying with us. I want to read this question for your, for your sake and also for the panel. Just read it again. Uh, we had some discussion, but watch. Every, every month we hear from parents and grandparents who are heartbroken over the decisions of young adults in their family who have walked away from the faith. What encouragement can you offer them is number one. And number two, what suggestions can you give young parents who are at the start of the process of raising children. So let, let's take this to the next level. What, what, what do you have to say, gentlemen? I think uh, Pastor Rich really did a good job of talking about how uh, 
our children reach a certain age at which they are making the, this decision for themselves. That's right. And um, to just speak a word of encouragement to those parents who are struggling with adult children who are, uh, who are making decisions that are maybe not what they would hope in terms of their spiritual lives. And uh, Rich, you referenced the, the proverb, you know, train up a child in the way they should go and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And uh, we all recognize that, and I think we probably all know people who did that very thing and their, their children seem to have departed from it. And just a, a word of encouragement that, um, that, you know, that's not an indictment that you failed as a parent. Um, just that reminder to keep praying for those kids and, um, and remember that you showed them things in their lives that, will, uh, that are living on in them, even if they're not doing what you hoped um, they would be doing at this point spiritually. In terms of, of recommendations or suggestions for young parents, I would just say um, you can't do it alone. You know, we believe that the parents are the primary disciplers of their children but we also believe it takes a church, it takes a community. Sure. We, uh, we need those other relationships. We've mm -hmm. touched on this, this already in this very show, uh, but, but um, you know, for you young parents out there, uh, dive into the life of a church, engage in the life of a church, and it will serve your family well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead, I just have three words, mm -hmm. build, nurture, maintain, and that would be relationship. Build a relationship with your children, nurture that relationship, and maintain that relationship. Yeah, yeah. And that never ends until you draw your last breath. I'm telling you. Kids need connection so bad. One of our great-grandchildren was at our house last week, and he just made the simple passing statement. He said, I just wish my dad paid more attention to me. Mm. He said that. And, and how, how old was he? Six. Six, mm -hmm. and he's got that that kind of sense to know that. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a problem. So, now, but, what are you gonna do about that? Did you talk with the dad about that? Did you share with him what his son, what his own son said about him? I actually talked with his father, the dad's father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ah, oh, to let him. I, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> and well, I will talk. I will right talk there. to him, but I mean, the dad's, the dad's dad is. The guy, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, this kid, I mean, the dad, needs to be told that his son has a deficit in his life, and right. and, and his that. and his father has already told him that. Yeah. So it's yeah. a process. If you don't catch it now, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, I remember coming out of church one day with my five children, and uh, a little old lady, who probably had nothing more than a high school education of that much, but she had the wisdom of God. She looked at my five kids and looked up at me and she said, son, keep them on your lap as <laughs> long as you can because when they get on your heart, they really get heavy, <laughs> you know? And that's the sum and substance of it, you know? You were talking about those three things, about how, how to keep them close to you and all that. That's, yeah. it takes I, that. I think this question really speaks to the changing dynamics of the family. When, when you are actively raising children and then the, the children grow into young adulthood and then they start their own families, where, where does that leave the parents? The, this, this whole family dynamic mm -hmm. really begins mm -hmm. to change. Yes, it does. And sometimes it changes for the good, mm -hmm. sometimes it changes for, for the bad. And, and that relationship that parents have with their children uh, continues to change and it continues to morph as everybody gets older. And um, the, the, what we read in Proverbs, I, I think is true. Everybody around this table, more than likely, had a time in their life where we kind of went our own way and maybe we went, maybe not away from the faith, but our faith just wasn't as important to us because we have other things to do. We have, we're getting our education or we're starting a family or you know the, the job is really beginning to, to pressures. So it's comforting, at least in my case, that my parents were there with me. They continued to pray for me as I went through that time to where when we started our family, I was able to, to realign myself back with my faith 
and, and we gave our children that opportunity because Boy. we were in church. Whenever the doors were open, we were there. Do you realize how precious that is that you had that in your, you had that guidance I in your life? I absolutely do. And I thank life. God for that yeah. because if, if it wasn't for that, who knows? I, I guarantee you I wouldn't be here right now. <laughs> I guarantee. So I, I would encourage this, this family to, to continue modeling Christ, continue talking, continue praying, continue to, to build relationships with the children and and it'll be okay. It'll be okay. You might find this hard to believe, but there's three things about that too. <laughs> okay. When what you're talking about is the children are first under your care, mm -hmm. you care for them, then you coach them, and then you counsel them ah, so as they grow older. Care? So you have to make sure you know which season you're in. You care, it's care, mm -hmm. coach, coach, coach. Okay. Consult. And consult. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. A, a mentor of mine, a pastor friend, would uh, draw uh, a timeline that, that showed how our authority as parents decreases over time, Ooh. but our influence hopefully increases. And that, you know, when they reach the age of 18, you know, they're adults, we don't really have much authority anymore as parents, but hopefully our influence lives on in the way that we've, yeah. um, you know, I'd like to have a dollar for every time I've said, my mother said, <laughs> I would be really wealthy. <laughs> yeah, right, that's terrific. Well, let's see here, what else can we um, get, get, get into here? A person, if a person never hears about Jesus, does he or she go to hell when they die? That's another question. Was my first answer to a question like that is always, I'm not God. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's a good place to start with it. It, it, it really is. Well, I, because I, you can't judge. You can't judge. Yeah. judge. I think that's what the Word says. And so just kind of to back up what Neil said in Romans chapter 12, or I'm sorry, Romans 2, starting at verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous, but God before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are the law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So Paul seems to be saying there in the book of Romans that this isn't for us to decide. This is, this is for God to decide. The question is, why are you asking the question? You know, I'd assume a, woman, a, 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 a parent is asking, of course, because they don't want to see their well, child. Go many to times it's a, a, a theoretical thing that we kick around to distract from me taking action in my faith. That's exactly mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. so do I, is there somebody I should be witnessing to? That's right. Is there somebody that, is there a decision that I need to make? Am, am I holding up a decision in my own life uh, because I want to argue about this kind of thing that is beyond my scope but is really in God's scope? And it's not saying that people shouldn't accept Jesus. None of us are saying that. What we're saying is people who've never heard, that's beyond us. That's God's decision. Of people who've clearly... Uh, been presented the gospel and rejected it, they've rejected God and you know, there are consequences for that. So I, I think the question is, why are you asking the question? And then, you know, trust God to deal with them. Don't, go, don't get hung up on, on those kinds of uh, things. God decides that stuff. I believe the Bible says that everybody will hear the gospel. Mm -hmm. So that's... It's not an if, it's when everybody hears the gospel. <laughs> Part of the nervousness and concern, I guess, for the parent is I, I can't, I can't, I can't make the decision for my child. Exactly I can't right. get the decision, get them to make that decision. And, yeah, but the question yeah. is if a person never hears, yeah. if a parent knows Jesus and they've not told their child they're yeah. wrong. That's yeah, possible. yeah. <laughs> so not to say you, you can't, you're not responsible for the decision that that person makes, right. but we are responsible for the witness that we project. I think there's a lot of um, 
there's, there's probably nuance in the question. Uh, we, I think about a term like the age of accountability or the age of responsibility, which, yeah. mm -hmm. which of course is, uh, is not a scriptural idea, but I think it's something that logically we all sort of understand. And, and then I also think, and Neil, this may speak to what you're uh, talking about, scripture saying, but the, the reality that there are places out there in the world where the gospel has not reached. And, um, you know, I, I think that while certainly acknowledging that I'm not God, that this is out of my, outside my scope, my ability to handle, I also think that scripture teaches us a lot about the character of God and that he, uh, he is exceedingly gracious that and that's something we ought to recognize in him again not you know acknowledging that i don't know the answer to these questions these are hard questions to wrestle with but i do know who god is and i know how he um how he interacts with his creation you you cannot at the same time say that man inherits original sin from adam and say that man doesn't also inherit the knowledge of good and evil Amen. Right. There's a there's a conscience. There's an awareness. Even if we don't know the law, even if we don't know the particulars, the word is very clear mm -hmm. that that God has written on our hearts oh, yeah. truth. And and so whether it's the presentation of the gospel and the cross, we, we know what is right and we're going to be judged by what we know. Right. And, and I think that's, that's right. a key point. A, a commentary that I read on, on Romans 2 was uh, in, in essence, the, the law becomes a law unto itself. Um, if a person never hears of the love of Christ, never heard about Jesus, yet they follow the law, the purpose of the law, which is to, to, to do good, to, to love others the way, to treat others as you would rather be treated, um, they, they become a law unto themselves and God will balance that with what they have been exposed to. So are they following the law of God without hearing necessarily about Jesus. Um, and we trust God to make the right decision at, at, at the end of the day, he will. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody who was already a Christian and they didn't know it? <laughs> that's what that's yes. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, very good. Well, you might as well talk a little bit longer because we can't go to another question. We've got less than a minute to go. <laughs> I had a real juicy question for you, but it might be for some other time. And it's really about, should we, um, should we not be teaching our children doctrine and apologetics? Because, I mean, things out there are really rough, are really rough. And I know it's a question we can't deal with now. We've got far less than a minute, probably down to 30 seconds by now. Well, but but I, the simple the, answer is yeah. no. No? I think the simple is we need to teach them to study the Bible for themselves. Okay. Right. So Very good. You, you can lean, you, I mean, yes, doctrine has its place and theology has its place. I'm not saying that catechism has its sure, place, sure. basic principles. But the, the simple truth is they need, we need to teach them how to study the Bible and discern truth through the guidance of the Holy Spirit for themselves so that when falsehood comes, they'll recognize it. They'll recognize it. Yes. Got to cut it right there. Yeah, I used to tell my kids that, that all the time. I'm teaching you the truth so that when the false comes up, you'll recognize it. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much for all of this. And we appreciate you here for these two weeks and, and all that you've shared. And I'm sure our audience has been blessed. Well, that's it for today. And we will be back again next week with another brand new program. So until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you. Bye bye. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at wtlw.com.